Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Same old life, war's over. 
one of the reasons I love the West Coast is people here ask me if I want marijuana rather than if I have marijuana. You understand? Right? Everywhere else I go, people are like, man, you got any weed? Man, I don't know you. Yeah, all right, come on. You want a brownie? I, I don't want a brownie right now because I'm talking to people. Uh, once I no longer have to talk to people, I will eat all of your brownies. And then I'll have crazy hashish lace dreams. Um, what were we talking about? Weed? For me, weed is the umami flavor of life. You understand? Right? Weed is the soy sauce. Weed is the ketchup. Weed is the ranch dressing of doing shit. Right? Some shit is cool. You put some weed on it, it's a little bit cooler. Right? Maybe it's not cool at all. Dip it in some weed, it's all right. Right? I don't care to wash dishes, but I don't mind getting high and washing dishes. Right? It's actually very pleasant. It takes an extra hour because I have to make a plate. Thank you, Ed. Let's hear it for New Jersey Weed Man, by the way. Who says people in New Jersey are rude? That was very polite. He brought me a joint and a lighter. Now he's going to smoke it for me, right? I will pass to the left. Mm. That's delicious. Is that a... Uh, the, the terpenes. It's got some purpoline and some sizzling in there. Right? I can taste the Listerine. This is going to make your breath great. This has great effects on breath. Oh, look at all these old, older people. We're all getting old, right? Some of us been here. Here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. This is what I noticed. Weed keeps you cute. Old stoners are way cuter than old drunks. Right? You know what I'm talking about? That's what I'm saying. Everyone's like, oh, cute. Grandpa's hitting the bong again. Right? As opposed to grandpa's hitting your mom again. That's a completely different... That's why, that's why I like weed. See if I can figure out where it's from with my chronosaur palette. You guys don't, you don't do chronosaur? You don't sit around with your fancy pants, give some tasting notes? It's from New Jersey, right? This is Toledo, was it? Uh, Toledo Window Box. Yeah, that's the old George Carlin. Somebody from Bellingham. This is the old elephant and castle weed. It's the Bellis Fair, bud. Someone swam over the river from Canada. I don't even know how you get to Canada from here. Practice. But everybody's fancy with the weed now. It's all like, oh, you know, everybody like has tasting notes. This delightful train wreck has notes of limonene and munchies. I don't know. People just make shit up. It's all so crazy. Who's in charge of naming weed, by the way? Do we need weed named green crack? Do you want weed that makes you act like crack? That's not cool. Let's change it up. Naming weed after people is also weird. My boy called me up the other day, right? He's like, hey man, I crossed a white widow with a train wreck. I call it Courtney Love. <laughs> that joke always kills in Seattle. <laughs> oh, take your time. Right, but people, there was weed named after Charlie Sheen for a minute. Charlie Sheen is not a weed head. Charlie Sheen is a crackhead. Would you smoke weed that makes you act like a crackhead? No, you wouldn't. I'm good on the Charlie Sheen. Do you have some Willie Nelson in the back, perhaps? Right? <laughs> Let me get an eighth of the Miles Davis, right? A half ounce of some Jerry Garcia, right? And a couple of grams of Snoop, because I'm going to a party later, and we don't love these hoes. And there's Obama Kush. That shit gets you so high, you stare off into space like a president. Thank you. Right? We need more minorities in the cannabis industry, by the way. Can you guys work on that? Can we work on that? Uh, you can help me fund my new business. I got a new business. We're gonna, uh, it's a minority staffed cannabis concentrates extraction company. Black Lives Shatter. I wrote that joke Friday. You can kiss my ass if you don't like it. Here, I'm hogging. Somebody hand that around. I don't want to be that guy. Right, all of a sudden you get, if I have the weed, the joint, and the microphone, then I'm really just like, no, no, no. You're like, that joint, I'll give you your lighter back too. All right. Because I will take your lighter, right? If I leave the house with three lighters, I come home with three lighters. 
they're not always the same three lighters. You guys know what I'm talking about. It's conservation of lighters. <laughs> lighters are neither created nor destroyed. They just spontaneously generated in liquor stores. <laughs> and Costco's. You guys know what I'm, I'm high as fuck. I'm getting to that rambly point. See, there's probably some hash happened this morning. I just ramble. You ever ramble? Like, see, I can smoke weed and come out and tell jokes. I practice that. But hash makes me rambly like an old hippie. You know what I mean? You ever hang out? Well, those cats digress, right? Shit gets, it gets tangential. You know what I mean? You ask him how to make a pie, he'll tell you how to grow a tree. Right? Oh, you want my apple pie recipe, man? That's great. That's fantastic. We've been friends long enough. I think you're ready. Uh, the first ingredient is love. Listen, I know it sounds corny, man, but people don't say it enough, and everybody acts like it doesn't matter. And if you don't start with love, it's never gonna taste right. So write that shit down first. You start with love, and then it's two cups of apples. I recommend a cross or a mix of the Fuji and the pink lady. The Fuji comes from Japan, which is interesting. It's one of the older variations. It started in Kazakhstan, which is the birthplace of all apples. I was in Kazakhstan one time after college because I followed the Silk Road on my vision quest, and it was there in this little hut that I met this cat. I think he was like a Uyghur or a Uyghur or whatever, but he had this hash. It was all brown and crumbly and delicious and kind of spicy. It smelled like cinnamon. It's two teaspoons of cinnamon. <laughs> You mix that. It just went on and on for days and days and days. Let's talk about crust, brother. Follow me. I want to show you these seeds I got from my friend Running Bear. I met him at a rainbow gathering in Wyoming in 1982, and we stayed up all night. We did psilocybin and mescaline, and we hybridized these gluten-free seeds, but they keep a flaky crust because the government's looking up the food supply. Now look, what are your intentions with this pot? Is this a pie of wooing or a pie of, it affects the nutmeg. Right? It took a week and a half. And, and it took me five years to actually make that pie. But it was the best pie I'd ever had in my life. Because I was finally ready for it, right? My tree had grown. I'm glad you stoners could hang on for the end of that story. I know it gets hard out there sometimes. Wait, what? How much cinnamon? <laughs> Uh, I'm a good cook though, I love to cook. I'm a good cook because of weed, right? Because I don't have a lot of money, so I will invent some shit to eat, you understand? If we have Bisquick and peanut butter, we got peanut butter rolls coming in 10 to 12 minutes. You know what I'm talking about? 12 to 14, really, I read the box. I looked in the pantry one time, we had marshmallows, margarine, and top ramen. I'm making ramen treats. They were hella good too. Don't use the flavor packet, that's fuck it up, it's not. A savory dish. I'm glad you guys know what Top Ramen is because sometimes you get an upscale crowd in Bellevue or some shit. I like to walk around Bellevue, people stare at me. Is he a Seahawk? I don't recognize him. He... Maybe he's a coach. He's kind of old to be on the team. But I say something about Top Ramen, and they just stare at me like, brr, brr, brr. right? I had to break it down to a crowd once. I was like, well, y'all know Cup of Noodles, right? Uh-huh, well, I can't afford a fucking cup. <laughs> I'm just trying to get old noodles, you understand? All right, this is day three of the Seattle Hemp Fest, so I've been pretty much high for 72 hours. Uh, yeah, right? you guys are like, woo, it's good for the arthritis. Right, medical marijuana, I have my card. It helps my pretendinitis. I, uh... <laughs> it keeps my stress levels down because getting arrested with <laughs> my stress. Do uh, <laughs> you understand? Right? It's an anti-inflammatory. <laughs> right? It keeps me from inflaming on people. Um, <laughs> some of you know what I'm talking about. I love weed. I, I smoke weed all the time. Whenever I'm done, I just like, that's my whole thing. People are always like, pot smokers never do anything. I'm like, I always like to get high and then do something. That's always my like, you get high and go to hemp fest, or you get high and tell some jokes, or you get high and get some booty or whatever. I don't care. The smoky pokey's great. But I'm saying, like, I'm on the golf course, high as shit, and nobody cares. Here's a secret about the golf course. The golf course is like a little tiny Vegas. You can do pretty much whatever you want. It's, I, no one ever said, even in states where weed is illegal, no one has ever said shit to me about my incessant use of marijuana whilst on the links. And I don't think they will. What would they say? They're gonna go over to the gay marshal. Hey, that black guy with dreadlocks has a bag of weed. Yeah, that sounds about right. 
right? You got a whiskey and a cigar. I got a blood and a Diet Coke. It's a beautiful day. We are all having a wonderful time out here. Keep your head down. Right. One time, I'm out on the links in Sacramento. I got paired up with this random middle-aged white dude. It's me and him on the golf course. We're right around the third hole. It was trying to smooth it out, right? Dial it in, lock it down, right? So I pulled out a fat hoot. I took a couple puffs. I did the neighborly thing. Hey, man, you want to hit? No, thank you. But do you have any crack? The f what? No, sir. And might I add, I find your presumptuousness somewhat off-putting. Because that's how I talk when I'm mad. I'm very precise. And secondly, who the f smokes crack on the golf course? What the f That's not going to help your swing. You can't. Right drug for the right activity, that's my point. Right, weed and golf makes sense. Booze and golf makes sense. Crack and golf don't make a lick of sense, you understand? You don't do a bunch of crank and go to a chess tournament. Right, you don't eat a bunch of mushrooms and try to run a marathon. What do you mean I'm off course? This whole planet is off course. I see through your whole thing, man. Why am I wearing a number? I'm not a number. I can't run a marathon on mushrooms. It'll take you three days. <laughs> laughing and crying the whole time, right? Just crying because your feet hurt and laughing because you're happy to have feet. That's how mushrooms work. They teach you the dichotomy, the necessariness of the yin and the yang, and why one must have a hint of the other. That's what it taught me. Some of you just dance around like assholes, uh, which is also cool. You know, I think that hemp, cannabis, marijuana is the most important plant in the world. And when we are able to restore hemp without regard to its THC content, but according to the varieties that make the best seed for fuel and fiber and food, the best stems and stalks for paper, building materials, canvas, rope, lace, and linen, and the best buds for medicine, when we grow that all as one crop, we will replace petroleum and change the whole economic and environmental paradigm. And it's gonna happen, folks. It is going to happen. We're going to replace petroleum with hemp seed oil. According to a study of wild hemp here in the United States, back in 1975, done uh, at uh, University of Illinois at Urbana, published in the American Midlands Naturalist from Notre Dame, one acre of hemp will make over 8,000 pounds of hemp seed. Now that's about 15 times more than the low THC varieties that they allow to be cultivated in Canada and that they're starting to allow here in the United States. So when we remove those bullshit restrictions and allow farmers to grow hemp for fuel without regard to its THC content, instead of poisoning the earth with petrochemicals will be reviving the earth. Instead of uh, taking energy out of the natural cycle, we'll be putting energy back in and we'll be creating food as a byproduct and fiber as a byproduct. So we won't have to deforestate this planet anymore. You know, cotton alone takes about 50% of all the world's pesticides. Hemp doesn't take any. So I urge you to go to hemp.org. You can find out a little bit more about that. Another one of the things I do is I've been blessed to be able to help medical marijuana patients. And a really bad law passed this year for medical marijuana patients. And it was signed into law. It's uh, Senate Bill 5052. We need to lobby the legislature and stop that from being fully implemented. It's already started to be implemented. So I have doctors that help patients get their medical marijuana permits at THCF medical clinics. And we are not going to completely comply with those laws. We're challenging the law and we're continuing to help patients all over the state. Over the past 10 years, we've been able to get over 100,000 Washington residents to become legal medical marijuana patients so they can possess, use, and grow marijuana. And we're not going to go away. You know, patients 
need to be able to grow it, but every person should be able to grow this plant. So there's an initiative out there right now, Initiative 739. We have it at our tables at the THCF Medical Clinic down by the main stage. We have another booth up by Sealy stage. We need to get signatures to put that on the ballot for a vote. So we urge you to go out there and sign these petitions because that's the way we change this, is we have to stand up and remain politically active. You know, this thing can continue to provide jobs for people, but change the whole energy paradigm and the economic paradigm. If we can replace petroleum, instead of having our money go to Exxon and Mobile and the Saudi sheiks and Nigerian despots, it'll go to our farmers and our farmers will spend it in our own communities. You know, the whole reason marijuana was criminalized was to stop its use as a fuel. It was really the petrochemical, pharmaceutical, military, industrial, transnational, corporate, elite, fascist, sons of a bitches who invented the marijuana myth. And it's only if we continue to stand up and tell the truth to power that we can restore hemp and save our environment and put food on our table. So I urge you to go up there, sign the petition. We all should be able to grow this until marijuana is cheap and plentiful and we can use hemp for energy again, we will not stop. In closing, I just wanna say, you know, this stage has been dedicated to Peter McWilliams for a long time. He was a great activist. And there's another fellow, Kevin Black, who uh, has been a hemp fest security volunteer for a long time. There are a lot of people that have passed carrying this torch to end marijuana prohibition. I urge you to go out there and do your duty and carry it further. Thank you again. Thank the Seattle Hip Fest and restore him. Bye bye. Cannabis is federally, federally illegal. We don't use the word marijuana at, can, at Hemp Fest, we use the word cannabis. <laughs> marijuana, that was used because of the racial uh, scapegoating that took place at the very beginning of prohibition. But cannabis is federal, federally illegal, so really, pot's not legal in Washington or Colorado or Alaska or Oregon or Washington, D.C. Because the federal government could come in and shut it down at any moment. We've made huge progress. Any of us can have a half ounce in each pocket, walk around the streets of Washington State, and it's legal. Hell yeah. That's huge progress. But when we took two steps forward, now we're taking a step and a half back. Senate Bill 5052 and Senate Bill 2136 here in Washington State have greatly rolled back medical marijuana rights that we won in 1998 with, with uh, I-692. Until this year, Legal medical marijuana patients in Washington State could have 24 ounces of marijuana and 15 plants. Well, that just got rolled back. That just got rolled back by our legislature. Now you can have six ounces and three plants. Three plants is not enough. Unless you're a master grower, you can't produce a month's supply with three plants. It's impossible. Not only that, if you don't sign the state registry, which of course the federal government could get a hold of and then know who you are. You don't have any medical marijuana rights in Washington State anymore. As of this year, as of months ago. That's what our state legislature just did to us. They completely gutted the laws and the freedoms, the medical marijuana freedoms that we won in 1998. Supposedly in the name of legalization. They're highly taxing cannabis. And you know, there's compromises you have to make and taxes are a reality. But patients shouldn't be taxed for their medicine because nobody else is in this state. So we still have a ton of work to do. Really, the heavy lifting is still ahead of us. Thank you very much, Tom Wershafter. Always been an inspiring for us. Um, yes, I wanted to first give a little, a short, short two phrases of each country as far as we know that's going on now. Um, first, to mention, uh, like Argentina is the last in the list. For the, if we if we can mention Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, and Chile, Argentina will be the last concerning the change of the law. 
we have we still have the same law since 1989, uh, which is totally a provisionist law, right? Um, then, if if we start from who is more advanced, we have to say Uruguay. Uruguay in December 2013 legalized cannabis for over the over the counter, the sales and production. They had three legs of production and sales, uh, which only two of them are currently available, which is the self-cultivation of homegrown and the creation of social clubs between 15 and 45 persons. That's what is actually working now. The other plan, the other part of the plan, which was to give through licensed growers to the through the pharmacies, that has not been implemented yet. So far, Uruguay is a step ahead of the rest of the countries. And second, we can say Chile, because Chile has had uh, big uh, advances since uh, improving themselves since uh, one year ago. The government authorized medical gardens for 200 patients. That was the first uh, pilot uh, um, project. And it went through, and now that's the same people are going forward. Uh, that's Ana Maria Gasmuri and the uh, Daya Foundation in Chile. And also the Congress is discussing six plants per residence and up to half kilo of dry butts in your property. Uh, that will be legal. It's not legal yet, but they are discussing in these terms in the Congress right now. And um, I mentioned Brazil. Brazil has a really repressive law. But this last year, th there was a Supreme Court decision that allows parents that have kids with epilepsy to import CBD oil from here, from California. Um, so that was an advance too. And you know, we got here to the States two weeks ago. Since these two weeks, we received the news that in Argentina, one of our medical patients that was sued in the the state, the city hall for allowing him to grow his own plants. Uh, finally, the Supreme Court gave the favor to the patient and now the, the government has to allow him to plant or give him the medicine. Okay, so um, basically um, this is what's going on objectively concerning the laws. They have not changed, they, I mean they changed, Uruguay changed, Chile is changing. And we, we think that Argentina must change too. You know, Argentina is the country that has more uh, uh, home growers, uh, cultivators. Uh, there's a big number of them. We created a movement of these people. We had, the last March, we had 150,000 personas. I'm talking about the Global Marijuana March. Uh, things are advancing. The message here that we wanted to give to all the people of the Haddison, uh, Seattle Hemp Fest is that, you know, the changes are made by people of, we say like in Spanish, bone and blood, you know, real people, real human beings. And some people are, you know, are not really conscious of this. And, you know, I think that you guys uh, are ahead with all this and you've got to put together all that conscious that you created all these years because I believe that when you don't have the law change in one state, you want to change the law from that state, and there is a group of people willing to do that, you got to go through all the process, right? Get the signatures, go to the ballot, and then win, and then make the changes. Well, that creates conscious around what you're doing. And I think that's the good part of it, and we creating a lot of conscious in this world change of cannabis. Thank you very much. Hola. Gracias por invitarme. Eh, les quería comentar la situación en Argentina. Eh, eh, nosotros hemos sufrido... Hace 30 años que volvimos a la democracia. I, I want to say thank you for inviting me here. Uh, we, in Argentina, 30 years we came back to democracy. Es una democracia representativa. It's a representative democracy. Eh, hemos sufrido, bueno, los mismos, la misma élite que es la que quiere dominar en el mundo y somete a políticas a los países terceros como el nuestro. The, the elite that controls the world and rules uh, also rules our country. 
eh, también nos ha impuesto políticas económicas y dictaduras militares. They have imposed military dictations and economic uh, policies. Entre ellas eh, la prohibición a las drogas y um, la guerra. Uh, among those, the prohibition of the war on drugs and the, the war. Eh, bueno, hace 30 años que volvimos a tener la democracia, pero tenemos una democracia representativa. Y eh, esto nos lleva a que la gente está saliendo a la calle y manifestándose, generando, bueno, en nuestro caso lo que es el pedido por el autocultivo en primera instancia. People are manifesting, are demonstrating for, at the beginning, for self-cultivation. Uh, and since we don't have a we have a representative democracy, people have to gain them in the streets. Por eso eh, es muy importante lo que pasa acá con una democracia participativa como en los referendos que ustedes pueden tener. So it's important what you do here with the ballots, with this representative democracy. It's different than ours. It's important what you do here, the impact for the rest of us. Y cada vez que acá hay un estado que legaliza o que normaliza el uso del cannabis, pone en ev evidencia eh, al gobierno federal, que es parte de esa élite que somete a los demás pueblos a llevar una política yeah. contra las drogas. Puts in evidence the federal government that's uh, doing another, a different thing worldwide. No? Por eso, bueno, es, hay que generar conciencia, información. Yeah. Generate conscious and give information. Eh, y estamos, bueno, ahora en este momento estamos peleando, estamos queriendo tener representación. En nuestro país no podemos tener eh, organizaciones canábicas ya que nuestra, la ley prohíbe todo. Yeah, the law prohibits, prohibits everything. We don't can even get together and make an organization concerning the law. So Entonces, we change all, todo es desde el pueblo hacia los representantes. So everything comes from the people to the representatives. Y ese es el gran cambio que estamos haciendo, conciencia poblacional, yeah. ciudadana hacia los representantes. That's the big change we're making, conscious of the citizens for the state. Okay. Thank you. Hemp Fest, happy Hemp Fest! Yeah. Oh boy, happy Hemp Fest, guys! This is huge, this is your personal freedoms at work. You think this stage gets built out of midair? Look at all these can of warriors around you, volunteering their time, putting their energy into this effort, which is called Cannabis Freedom. So celebrate, today is our day. Tomorrow is our day. Every day should be our day. Yeah. I was thinking, trying to think why, um, what I want to talk to you guys about and why I'm up here. You know, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, last year I was just out there, a vendor, uh, handing out cards, giving out information, telling people, keep Washington green. Yeah. Right? People were like, what do you mean keep Washington green? We just legalized it. Does this look like legalization to you? Why? Because you're fleeing to the rocks and under the trees to smoke some freaking cannabis? Well, you know what? I'm really proud of our Hemp Fest crew and our Hemp Fest staff because they're keeping our freedoms alive and our dreams alive and they're doing their thing. And you know what, this reminds me of years past in Hempfest when we still celebrate our freedoms and we still smoke cannabis where we want to and how we want to. And we're gonna continue to do that. So celebrate today. I have a main message to you. This, uh, this battle is not done. We have a lot of work to do. Uh, there's, a, there's a recreational scheme which we have in our state where you can purchase cannabis, that's great. I voted for that, I'm fighting for that. I know business owners that are putting in their due diligence. I also know some really lame business owners that are doing some poor stuff for our industry, but we won't talk about that right now. What we will talk about is the fact that just because we can buy it in a store doesn't mean it's free. I want to grow it in my backyard. I want to smoke it where I want to. I bet you do too. 1.7 million people in this state voted for I-502 
And about three quarters more of that still think that you can grow plants in this state just because you don't have a medicine card. You know what? I think we all need to get educated about what our public policy is, what our state policy is, and get involved. I know one thing's for sure. I clamored up to the state politics this last year and observed the most dysfunctional state legislative session in the entire history of Washington State. We went through three sessions. That's one session plus two more. And we couldn't even figure out our state taxes. And in fact, if you're watching, the state Supreme Court just sued our state legislature $100,000 a day until they figure out how to educate our freaking kids. I'm upset. I am a citizen. I voted for cannabis freedom. They're taxing it, and they can't even educate my kids. I want you guys to get involved because this is not going to end. We need to go up there and tell them, I want my cannabis. I don't want it to be shoved through a tax-regulated system and come out dirty. I want to have my rights. And we're not going to get our rights until we get up there, we clamor up there and tell all of them, this is how I want it, and I want it right now. Because if we don't do that, what they're going to do is they're going to do what they did to 502. They're going to stifle it. They're going to throw 54% in this state into default of a state law. That's actually in conflict with our state constitution. If you read Article 11, Section 11, it's only two lines long, so please look it up. It says, no jurisdiction can pass laws that are outside of general law. That means they cannot ban cannabis. They cannot ban our rights to safe access. They cannot do what they're doing. And we need to go into those city councils and those county commissioners, we need to tell them, you are wrong. It says so right here in our Constitution. And I don't care what organization and what Attorney General comes out with any opinion, our citizen rights stand. Get involved with me, guys. It's not that hard. I only put in a couple of days a week. I still do a lot of fun things. I work with awesome people every day. And people share cannabis with me every day. And when they do that, they break the law. I don't want to do that anymore. I want to be free. I want to be a person. I want to be a professional. I want to be whoever I want to be and have the right to cannabis. And I want you to have that right too. Right? I want you to take, pay attention to one other thing. In Denver, Colorado, maybe they're doing it right, maybe they're doing it wrong, but one thing they are doing is they got a general ballot to a local level to consume cannabis in public at, at any location that has any other smoking. So if you are in a cafe or a restaurant and they have a smoking area, you can consume cannabis out there if it's okay with that owner of that it's, uh, uh, entity, right, at that establishment. So think about that, guys. We're all around here frustrated. We just want to smoke some cannabis. We have to go over here to the rocks. We have to go over there. You know, they can serve alcohol. They can tax alcohol, but they can serve cannabis. No, what is going on here? We need to check this out. It only takes, what was it, 3,700 citizens in the city of Denver? I bet you it takes a little bit around that here in Seattle. So I'm going to ask you one last thing. If you care about cannabis and you care about freedom of cannabis, get involved. Come on, boy! Hope you're having a happy day. It's great to be here in Seattle. It's great to be here after legalization, but work is not done. There is Work is not done, and the rest of it isn't going to do itself. You have to register to vote. If you know somebody that's not registered to vote, get them to register to vote. That's the first thing I wanted to tell you about. The second thing about, I want to tell you about is, is that freedom is not free. Having this event as a free event isn't, isn't a reality. It's a gazillion dollar operation. It's really expensive and we got rained out yesterday. So if you were going to kick down five yesterday, kick down ten today. If it was going to be ten, kick down twenty. It was going to be twenty, kick down fifty. It was going to be fifty, kick down a hundred. And so on. Yeah. The other 
other thing is, you know, you know, it's a couple years after 502, and many of us had disagreements with each other about that, but there's too few of us to be divided. More love, less attitude. Okay, Seattle, can you give us some of that, please? So that we can move forward together and finish the work so that nobody gets fired from their job just because they're a consumer. Nobody is denied housing just because they're a consumer. We have to, we have to end can a bigotry, and the way to do that is to come out of the closet, is to talk to people, is to let them know, listen, I'm not a recreational marijuana smoker. I'm a responsible adult consumer. Just like people consume alcohol responsibly, I consume cannabis responsibly. And you have to have that conversation. So, and that's pretty much it. I really, I just, uh, it's, uh, it was a great day today. Everybody be safe on your way home. Thanks. What does it do for you? How does it affect you? How much taxes will they get if they include you? Because sometimes it's just the money. In Oregon, if they decide that they don't want to participate, they don't get any of the money. I'm kind of looking forward to see how well that plays out for them. All of a sudden, Portland is going to become uber, uber rich. And cities like Sandy, Sandy right next door, who boldly spoke up to my friend and told him, no, you may not open a dispensary here. Well, why not? How come I can't open a dispensary here? Oh, because we don't like you. How is that acceptable? If your city or your county tells you, we don't want you here and we don't like you here, you need to stand up and tell them I'm here and you're going to like me. You're going to accept that I use cannabis and I'm going to vote you out if you don't. Because your vote counts and your money counts. I love you guys. Please share love. Please be respectful. Please put money in the bins. This festival's expensive. We love you. Speak up. So as I said, I'm Roger Goodman. I'm the state representative, the chair of the House Public Safety Committee in the House of Representatives. And uh, cannabis used to be in my jurisdiction because it used to be illegal, but now it's in the Commerce Committee jurisdiction, which is pretty cool. Um, and we now have not just the Liquor Control Board, the Liquor and Cannabis Board, officially, as of a few weeks ago. So a lot of changes happening here in Washington, helping to lead the world again. It's really uh, sort of parallel universes. We cannot forget what's going on in the rest of the country. And some are making more progress uh, than others. But Washington needs to be careful as we continue to lead the way. Uh, but so far, I think it's it's doing well. It's doing well enough. The market, the commercial market, has a time to settle down. But we have to worry about people who are truly medically needy. People who don't want to take the toxic petrochemical pharmaceuticals. And they depend on it, and they need a lot of it. They don't smoke it or vaporize it. It's oil, and they ingest it. And it's... Uh, they, they don't, they can't afford it. So I'm worried about that. And in the legislature, I'm gonna to continue to be a voice to take care of the truly medically needed. On the other hand, we have, not really on the other hand, but another issue, major issue, is the market itself. This new legal market, which so far I think is, is a showcase. We have a lot of flaws, and yet, with more retail availability and a sort of a supply and taxation that makes sense, it will take years to adjust. Uh, we will, again, show the world how it should be done. So, the dam has burst. Cannabis prohibition is over. The war on marijuana is over. And we'll look back on history, you know, but we were still fighting it and it still cost a lot and so forth. But in the minds of Americans, and really in the minds of the world, the war on marijuana is over. So to preside over that, after having been a drug policy reformer, and when I got elected, boy, they hit me hard. He wants to legalize marijuana. My vote went way up after that, after the people found out. The people are way ahead of the politicians and the opinion leaders. And so it's fun to be ahead of the curve and to kind of say, I told you so. But we're doing it right. And so it's part of, I'm proud to be a part of that. So thank you very much. Thanks to Hempfest. And keep it up. Keep up your voice. Eh, somos un movimiento joven. Hemos nacido hace un, más de una década. 
Eh, realmente hemos, nos hemos nutrido de todo lo que acá ha empezado hace bastante tiempo y estamos luchando en esa... En, nos hemos sumado a la lucha de la reivindicación en la prohibición de la planta de cannabis. Eh, en nuestro caso, los gobiernos están siguiendo las normas internacionales que los gobiernos federales de este país imponen. Estos mismos gobiernos a nosotros nos han metido en colapsos económicos, en dictaduras militares que nos han traído desapariciones y muertes a más de una generación. Y estamos aquí para dejar este mensaje, para poder seguir adelante, para decirles a todos ustedes que cada vez que un Estado vota a favor de la legalización, está dejando en falta al mismo gobierno federal que nos impone en todo el globo la prohibición. Entonces lo deja en falta y cada vez ganamos más terreno. Así que venimos a apoyarlos y darles gracias. Okay. So, so basically, what you guys do here has a global impact. What you guys legalize here, Colorado, Washington, Alaska, and Oregon, is a huge, huge impact for the rest of the world. The government federal, the federal government sets a policy, and it's followed by every single country. So it's important. We we want we came here to say thank you for this country culture that all these years you guys have fight so bad, had struggled so badly. And, and this is the result. The result is that we're changing the world with cannabis. And now we, we want to encourage you to keep on the hard work because it's not done yet. We haven't finished yet. We need to finish prohibition. Prohibition is still encapsulating innocent people in my country, like 20,000 per year for nothing, just for consuming this miracle herb, this healing herb. So uh, I want to thank all the, 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 the pioneers here that made this possible, that have been educating us all these years. Jack Herrera, Don Shafter, Paul Stanford, um, uh, Jorge Cervantes, Ed Rosenthal, Mickey Norris, Chris Conrad, those are our heroes, we follow them. Thank you for the culture. Thank you for constructing this bridge over to South America and to the rest of the world. We want to liberate the plant to heal the sick and to heal this world. Thank you. Uh, we say no to Monsanto over there in Argentina. We see it at first hand what they're doing with their, with their uh, chemicals and with their GMO. So we say no to Monsanto. We say yes to life. Yes to life. Yes to the vida. Thank you, uh, Seattle. Thank you, America. Keep on the hard work. Free Eddie Lep. Thank you. Hasta la victoria, siempre. Mucho moto para mí para ti. Thank you, Mike Ferrari. Uh, I started working with the Grateful Dead in 1988. I was running the rock medicine team. I, I was buck stopper for the down tent. And when Jerry died in 1995, Uh, that same month, we were having a hemp rally up here in Seattle, and I retired from running the rock medicine team and decided that I needed to go to the hemp rally. I'd been playing hemp rally since 1991, and uh, I came up here, I played on main stage, and when I was done with that, I helped uh, just do rock medicine, take care of the crowd issues and, you know, things that come up in the crowd. What we discovered was in a hemp rally, there are not too many things that come up in a crowd, a lot less than they did at the dead shows. So. It's been a, a long journey. That was 1995, and here it is, 2015, and I'm still here. Uh, I, I represent Seattle Hemp Fest uh, as the Grand Price Committee now. I've been opening act for 19 years, uh, and we, uh, we, we just have a whole bunch of, uh, of things that we do to try to raise money for the cause now. So it's, you know, it's kind of turned from a, a gut-wrenching, everybody's going to jail, to now a celebration, and everybody's here, and they're all making money, and And you know it's it's a different world now than when we started, and you know, as you know, so I'm just glad to be a part of it still. I, I'm really grateful to be here. Well, you bring up a really good uh, common point when people say, "Well, why do you still need to do that? Didn't you win?" Yeah, we won here in Washington a little bit, 
and we won a little bit in Oregon, we won a little bit in California, we've won a little bit in some states, but quite frankly, there's still people getting cops pulling them over every day. There's still people who are getting arrested every day. There's still people getting getting in, you know, put in jail. There's still people being fined, going to prison, losing their kids, getting their dog shot in their front yard. There's still people, as long as that is going on, we'll be here. You just want to make sure your voice is being heard and you know, I mean, if you if you really believe in what you're doing, you got to stand up and you got to speak the truth. So that's all I've really ever tried to do was stand up and speak the truth, either in my in my written word, in my vocal word, in my singing word. It's just stand up and speak the truth, and uh, it, speak the truth to power. You'll never lose out. Speak the truth to power. And so that's what we've tried to do here, as a, as a conscious effort throughout all the years that we've been here at the, the Hemp Fest. <laughs> This is my first time ever at Hub Fest, so I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much for coming out to listen, and uh, I feel honored to be up here to tell my story. Um, it is really surreal to be up here. I know it's a little cliche, but if you would have told me like a year ago or even a couple months ago that I'd be up here on this stage today talking to all of you about marijuana, I probably wouldn't have believed you. And that's because I've only been talking about it for about three weeks. Uh, up until then, I was a local news anchor in Eugene, Oregon, and I, you know, that was the job I dreamed of having. I went to college for it, but it was abruptly cut short when I was forced to take a drug test, and I failed due to THC. Uh, most of you probably agree that these sort of drug testing policies in the workplace are ridiculous, but, <laughs> but unfortunately, even in Oregon and in Washington and other states where it's been legalized, it's still perfectly legal to have these sort of drug testing policies. Um, it's a complete double standard and we just need to keep talking about it. Uh, the fact is, no one wants an unsafe work environment. We can all agree on that. But if people are allowed to use alcohol or pharmaceuticals or tobacco or what have you in their free time, then they should be able to use marijuana in their free time because it's a safer alternative. <laughs> Uh, the fact is, I was, I was fired for having inactive THC in my system, even though I was 100% sober at work every day that I reported to work. If I would have stuck to, you know, the encouraged vices of drinking or using pharmaceuticals, I would still have my job today as a local news anchor. You and I probably see that ridiculous double standard, but a lot of people don't understand that still. And it's, I think, our responsibility to point it out so that people do understand. That's the only way we're going to ever see more changes to policies and laws. We're doing a great job right now, but there is still a long way to go, obviously. <laughs> when you're familiar with cannabis and you know its effects and you've used it and you're exposed to it, I think that it's kind of hard to even understand how people can be so against it or, you know, even understand why we're having this argument. But I think it all comes back to a lack of exposure. If we just expose people to the truth more about cannabis, then I think a lot more people would understand and support it. I don't know, maybe some of you have even changed your views on marijuana over the years. I know I was a dare kid. I, you know, was 10 years old being told all these facts about marijuana that I just took at, for fact because I didn't know any better and I was so young. But then as I got older and I was actually exposed to marijuana and exposed to people who use cannabis, I realized that it wasn't as scary as everyone made it out to be, but it took that exposure. And I really truly believe there are a lot of people out there that are just like me, that if they were exposed to it and they knew the truth, there'd be no way that they could possibly be against it. You can be part of the change if you just talk to your friends, family, peers, if you haven't already, about your cannabis use. Actually just tell them that using marijuana doesn't make you a bad person. And that seems like kind of a fact that we all understand here, but a lot of people out there don't. There's still all these misconceptions that just using this plant makes you a bad person. We need to keep talking about it and we need to put an end to it. If you're thinking about coming out of the cannabis closet, uh, I've learned a few things so far and I just want to share them with you. Number one, I, like I said, it's only been about three weeks and the response has been overwhelmingly positive. Almost everyone who's reached out to me individually has not only, you know, been so supportive, but they've thanked me for talking about this because there are so many people out there that will still lose their family, lose their jobs, maybe even go to jail if they even talk about this. So I think that 
you know, here in a state where it's legal, if you can talk about it, please do, because the overwhelming support shows we have strength in numbers. We just need to keep talking about it. Number two, the haters are still going to hate, unfortunately, but it's not necessarily a bad thing because fortunately all the ignorant and cruel comments have been outnumbered by a ratio of about 15 to one. And even though they're talking about it, and negatively, they're still talking about it. And that leads me to number three. Even though the this, this haters have spoken up, coming out of the cannabis closet is totally worth it. Because even when they're using their ignorant remarks, it's in the end, the story is getting everyone to talk about the facts. And if you know the facts about cannabis, the facts are in our favor. Therefore, I believe because of the facts, the social acceptance of cannabis use is inevitable. It's gonna happen. It's just a matter of how fast it happens. And the only way it's gonna happen is if we keep talking about it. So take it from me, a former local news anchor, now marijuana activist, you will not regret it. So just keep talking about it. Thank you so much. We're down to less than a minute left to go, Marlon. Man, you know, I swear we're here in 2015, right? And how can a person be on a show without it's selfie time? <laughs> All righty, <laughs> there we go. Now that's going to be posted on social media somewhere, along with SOS for the cannabis clubs. This is going to be a benefit concert to be able to help the cannabis clubs in the future uh, with legislation and maybe some law, and then we'll go from there. Nikki, come to the other spot, check us out, 72nd and Harold doing something every single day of the week. Seven 72nd days a week. Southeast. Harold, tune in next week. John's going to play a few chords on the way out. We will have some tape shows until January 8th, and we'll be back live and help us restore hemp. Good night. Ganja. I like very ganja.